Morning, everybody. Lovely to see you in such fine voice. Can I ask you to reach for a Bible, please, and turn with me to page 742. 742, you should find Daniel chapter 5 there. We're going to look at this together before we share the Lord's Supper in a few moments' time. Let me just add my welcome to Matty's as you do that, particularly those with us for the first time or back with us after some time away. Absolutely delighted to have you uh, with us this morning. I hope you can come tonight as well for that guest service, and indeed the friends will be able to come with you. Let me lead us in prayer as you find page 742. Sovereign God, who is mighty to save, and able to humble those who walk in pride. Have mercy on us, we pray this morning. Show us yourself again. Quieten and uh, humble our hearts before you. Help us to know you and your salvation. And give us confidence in who you are, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, You'll see that it's a a long chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 to 9 and then verses 17 to 31 that will give us the flavor, I hope. Starting at verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold round his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. What happens next is that the queen remembers Daniel Uh, encourages the king to come and get Daniel, says he has this track record of interpreting dreams. You should listen to what he has to say. So Daniel is fetched and uh, is promised this role of being third ruler in the kingdom if he can explain what's going on. We pick it up at verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, And his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly. He was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. 
But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then from his presence, a hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel and parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed, was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put round his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Uh, please do keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline as uh, usual. I think you'll find it helpful this morning on the back of the notice sheet. I'm sure you find it helpful every morning, but this morning there's a particular reason to have it in front of you. There's a, a moment in the film Titanic um, that has become pretty iconic. If you've not seen it, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but the boat has hit an iceberg and uh, we know and the architect knows that the boat is about to sink, but almost everyone else on board is oblivious to the danger. And so you then get this scene in which the architect, a guy called Thomas Andrews, is walking around the boat in stunned disbelief. And uh, there's a look of horror on his face that contrasts massively with what everyone else is doing. Because all this while, the orchestras are playing and everyone's in evening dress and uh, dancing and ordering cocktails, and they're having the time of their life. And they're completely unaware, as he puts it, that within an hour or so, the unsinkable ship will be at the bottom of the Atlantic. Uh, it's not unlike the events of Daniel 5. The date is October the 11th, 539 BC. And within 24 hours, one of the great empires in world history will have fallen. Uh, Babylon, the impregnable, will be conquered by the new kids on the block from Medo-Persia. But tonight, the new king, Belshazzar, is having a party. Uh, it's a story that starts with a feast and ends with a funeral. And um, we're going to look at it under two headings. As the, the big lesson that we're seeing all the way through Daniel is underlined once again. Earthly rulers will come and go, but it is the Lord who reigns on high. So first, the king who refuses to be humble, the king who refuses to be humble, meet Belshazzar. He's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the guy who became a Christian at the end of chapter four, you'll remember. And uh, their two stories have a lot in common at first, but then very, very different endings. From the get-go, Belshazzar is the stereotype of a rich trust fund kid as he comes across in the, the passage. His entire empire is about to collapse so he decides to invite his mates over along with all of the pretty women he knows, it seems, and proceeds to behave outrageously. You can picture the scene. This is a, a banquet on the largest scale. The entire aristocracy of Babylon has been invited. The drinks are flowing. Lots of commentators suggest from the language that it's little more than a drunken orgy. But our writer is less concerned, interestingly, with the immorality than with what the king did next. Verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Uh, impossible to overstate the incredible sacrilege and blasphemy of the act. It's like our writer can't quite believe it happened. He repeats it twice, verse two, then verse three. And then he explains what the temple is, just in case we've missed how horrendous this scandal is. This arrogant young king takes vessels that are designed for the worship of the creator 
and uses them to praise his own gods of gold and silver, wood and stone. It's deeply symbolic, uh, a power play, suggesting as he raises the goblet that he holds God in the palm of his hand. It is a declaration of war on the Almighty. And what makes it even worse is that Belshazzar wasn't acting in ignorance. Uh, Daniel's commentary on the king's behavior makes that clear. It starts in verse 18. That's why I read it with the recap of Nebuchadnezzar's story that we know from last week. You remember all of the greatness and the majesty and the glory that had been given to him by God, given the global, the absolute power that he enjoyed. Pick it up, verse 20 again. When his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. Verse 21 is a summary of chapter four. Then Daniel makes his point in verse 22 and he doesn't pull any punches. Listen to this bit. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart Though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. The vessels uh, of his house have been brought in before you. Your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk from them. You've praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath, you have not honoured. So Belshazzar wasn't ignorant of God. Um, He knew all about the Lord of heaven. He knew that every good gift that he'd ever enjoyed was a gift from God. He knew from firsthand experience what happens to people who raise up their heart against God, as Nebuchadnezzar had done. And still knowing all that, he chose not to honor God, but to lift himself up against him. It's the only time in the Bible God is called the Lord of heaven. And it's there to to highlight both the the magnitude and the madness of what Belshazzar is doing. Who in their right mind lifts themselves up against, declares war upon the Lord of heaven? You knew all this, yet still. It's a fascinating insight into the, the heart of sin. Just by the, the by, here's the king at his frat party. There's all manner of drunkenness and immorality going on, it seems. But when Daniel zeroes in on the thing that offended the king most that night, he doesn't talk about his moral conduct, but his heart attitude. It's because the behavior is a, a symptom of what is going on in the heart. The real sin disease is when we refuse to honor the Lord of heaven in humility and we choose to lift ourselves up against him. I want to suggest that means Belshazzar is a much more relatable figure than he first appears. Um, I don't suppose that many of us were born into a royal family. Uh, I had a friend in London who was a princess in an African tribe uh, working as a secretary in London, but not many grew up in a palace, I guess. Another friend helped run a big multinational company, but again, not many of us have yet, I take it, presided over vast global empires. But while it, it might be hard, therefore, to relate to Belshazzar's day job and lifestyle, then you find it all too easy to relate to the attitude of his heart. Listen to the Apostle Paul's definition of sin from Romans 1. Although we knew God, we did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. He goes on, we exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Big echoes of Daniel 5. Belshazzar might be a king. But his heart is the same as every one of us, apart from the work of Jesus in our life. God holds our life in the palm of his hands. Every breath is a gift without which we'd expire. 
All our days are numbered and written in his book. I wonder, could any of us claim to have given adequate honor to the Lord of heaven? Or think of our wider society, creation around us, the conscience within us. They tell us all that we need to know about the eternal power of God. But look at um, our schools, look at our universities, listen to the media, to our politicians. Does anyone think that our school, our land gives adequate honor to the Lord of heaven? We don't even try to as a country, which means we are Belshazzar. We've declared war on the God who gave us breath. And the lesson that God has for us is that pride comes before a fall. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar taught us that lesson last week. Belshazzar teaches it again this morning. So many in our world are like the revelers on the Titanic, totally unaware of the danger we're facing. We want to remember, though, that it's not yet too late to head to the lifeboats, that there is a place of safety and refuge in Jesus Christ, that he came to die on the cross so that we might not be treated as our pride deserves, nor repaid according to our iniquities, but that we might receive grace and love and life in him and from him instead. It's never too late until we've taken our final breath to humble ourselves before God and ask for his mercy. But one day it will be too late. And if we don't humble ourselves in this life, then on the day that we stand before God as our judge in the next, he could rightly say to us what Daniel said to Belshazzar. You knew all this. You knew all this. But still you have not honored me. What a tragedy that would be. But if we are Christians here this morning, I take it that our ongoing sin isn't exactly the same as Belshazzar's. His was this um, settled, this complete defiance of the rule of God in his life. That doesn't describe the attitude of our heart. We're not at war with God. If we're Christians, we worship him and are adopted into his family. We've been given peace and reconciliation with him. But insofar as there are traces of Belshazzar in us still today, I reckon we ought to be letting this echo around in our souls this morning. Pride comes before a fool. You wouldn't want to be in the habit of knowing truth about God and doing nothing with it. That would be a dangerous place to be. You take too many steps down that road. And for any one of us, it could easily become a way of life. We're being encouraged then to humble ourselves afresh before God this morning. You know, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. I want to encourage us all to return to his love again this morning as we share the Lord's Supper. He has promised that if we humble ourselves before him now, he will exalt us forevermore in his glory. And if we need any extra motivation, it will come in our second point. The king who refuses to be humble and now the Lord who refuses to be mocked. Um, Just as we get into this, I mentioned a few weeks ago that um, although the rest of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, uh, by and large, this chunk of of Daniel from chapter 2 to chapter 7 is written in Aramaic um, because it's got a message for the whole world. That was the common tongue of the day. What I didn't say was that our author gave the chapters a a sandwich structure that underlines the main teaching point of the book, and that's what you can see on the outline. So chapter two is a vision of an eternal kingdom, and then chapter seven is a vision of an eternal king. In chapters three and six, God's people stand firm in faith even when they're threatened with death, and God rescues them. And then the middle of the sandwich is chapters four and five, deliberately put their two stories or the stories of two kings who set themselves up in proud opposition to the God of heaven. And the the pivot around which the whole thing turns is those last few words of verse 37 of chapter four, where we read, those who walk in pride, he, the king of heaven, 
is able to humble. The message of those two stories, that God steadfastly refuses to be mocked. He will always humble his opponents in the end. Sometimes he does it in this life in salvation, like Nebuchadnezzar, like many of us. Always, if not, he does it in judgment, as with Belshazzar, because you cannot mock the king of heaven forever. Um, let's look more closely at the way the drama unfolds. There's Belshazzar enjoying his feast, blaspheming the God of heaven. Verse 5, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, his thoughts alarmed him, his limbs gave way and his knees knocked together in an instant then the the music stops the party ends and everybody sobers up belshazzar himself is terrified here is a message from god on the wall in front of him the color drains from his cheeks his knees not together and um, where it says the the limbs gave way beneath him uh, the the lots of scholars think it refers not to his limbs but to his bowels so that uh a little puddle appears at his feet or something even worse than that. As this brash king shrinks before our eyes. Uh, we've seen the next scene a few times in Daniel. Belshazzar calls in his army of astrologers, offers a great reward to anyone who can interpret the writing. None of them can. All is not lost. The queen mother remembers Daniel, urges Belshazzar to summon him. By now, Daniel's in his 80s, okay? this point. Um, so picture him shuffling with a walking stick and fading eyesight, his face creased in, in worldly terms. This is the last bloke you go to in a crisis, but he's Belshazzar's only hope. So the king makes his offer. Tell me what it means. I'll make you the third ruler in my kingdom. It's a slightly pathetic prize when you remember, well, who wants to be the third, the ruler, the third ruler in a kingdom? that is going to be overthrown by the morning. It's not a great prize. Daniel says, you can keep your reward, but I'll tell you what it means anyway. It means, O king, that you have failed to learn from Nebuchadnezzar's mistake. You haven't humbled your heart. You haven't honored the Lord. And the writing on the wall is God's response. Verse 25, this is the writing that was inscribed, mene, mene, tekel, and passing. And this is the interpretation of the matter, mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Uh, you'll see there's a verdict, a reason, and a sentence. Verdict is mene, God has had enough. Uh, up until now, there's been a door of opportunity. At any point, Belshazzar, you knew all this. You could have humbled yourself in repentance and faith, but you refused. So now the clock on your reign is ticking. The reason is tackled. God has set up scales in heaven. On one side are the weights of justice and goodness and giving God the honor that he deserves. On the other side is you, Belshazzar. Your life has been weighed and you've been found wanting. And so the sentence is Perez or passing. That's the plural of Perez. God gave you your kingdom in the past, and now he's gonna take it away and give it to another. So that is God's word to you, Belshazzar. It's your epitaph, numbered, numbered, failed, defeated. And as God announced, so it happened, verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed. Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. We'll hear more about Darius next week. But the lesson is that the writing is on the wall. Because God wants the whole world to learn from Belshazzar's mistake in a way that the king himself had refused to learn from Nebuchadnezzar's. If we as individuals or as a culture walk in pride, if we fail to honor the Lord of heaven, he will humble us. Sometimes in this life, if we see the error of our ways, if we acknowledge God as our God, 
But if we don't humble ourselves willingly in this life, he will humble us in the next in judgment. Um, Jesus himself taught the same thing over and over again. Three separate occasions in the Gospels, he says, everyone who exalts themselves now in this life will be humbled in the next. But anyone who humbles themselves in this life will be exalted in the next. Always the same warning, always the same offer of mercy to all who humble themselves. Everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled. Everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. Uh, I've put two implications on the sheet. Uh, the first is pretty obvious. I, I take it for each one of us, there is a choice to be made. Will I relate to God like Nebuchadnezzar or like Belshazzar? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar got it wrong for many years. He was full of pride. He chased his own glory. But eventually, we saw last week, he lifted his eyes to heaven and admitted the error of his ways. He stopped fighting God. He started instead to bless and honor and praise the one who lives forever. Option one. Option two is Belshazzar. And he knew all that, but persisted in stubborn rebellion against God. He revealed his heart at that moment when he stood in front of a thousand of his lords and wives and concubines and praised his gods whilst mocking the Lord of heaven. His settled position was that there is no need to fear the Lord of heaven. God was someone that he was happy to ignore. If ever he would need a deity to save him, he was sure that the gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood and iron and stone would do the job. Do you spot that little throwaway description that Daniel gives to Belshazzar's gods in verse 23, though? He says, you chose to praise the gods who do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath, the one true God, you haven't honored. So there's a sad irony in Belshazzar's heart. He dismisses God because he thinks he's impotent and he trusts instead in gods that are powerless to save. And we are meant to register that every other God, everything else you could put your trust, your confidence in, everything else you could live for, everyone else will let you down in the end. They can't save us. So there's the choice. It doesn't actually matter which culture we grew up in, what we grew up believing. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we've made in this life. This is the, the choice that matters. God has set the scales in heaven. Our life is being weighed. Will we acknowledge and honor him as our Lord and God? But if that's the warning to the world, then the message to God's people is one of confidence and of comfort. Um, the first readers of Daniel didn't enjoy any great political power or social influence in their day. They were surrounded by people who walked in pride and defied their God. And as we read Daniel, it looks as though some of his intended audience were beginning maybe to wobble a bit in their faith. Is our God really almighty? Seems to have been a question. Is the cost of our daily obedience worth it? Or should we chuck it in and, and worship the same gods as everyone else? Just go with the flow of the God-defying world around us. We know that in our day too, of course, it's pretty similar. There are many who set themselves up against God, reject his truth, oppose his people, live for other things. And living in a world like that can get to God's people. We know in our society, whenever there's a debate about some moral or ethical issue, some new trend in society, the, the one voice that we will not hear on our media is the voice of someone who knows and loves Jesus and can contend for his truth warmly and clearly. Everyone else will be encouraged to proclaim their truth, to speak their truth in the middle of every debate. But God's truth is at best unwanted 
and more often caricatured and derided. And it can start to wear us down as God's people over time. Do we really believe that God is Lord and judge of all or has the tide of secularism and wokeism and everything elseism swept away any credibility that our faith once had? Is it worth believing in a God who's ignored by the world? Is it worth the cost of daily discipleship saying no to sin? No to the people that encourage us to sin, saying yes to Christ. Daniel 5 reminds us not to be surprised by the state of the world around us. It is not a new thing for powerful people and empires to declare war on God. They always have and they always will. But listen, it's not as if God quakes in his boots uh, every time some atheist brings out a new book or a new survey comes out and says, God will be dead in 50 years. The church will be empty or whatever. Because God knows that all of his ways are right. All of his works are just. He knows that he has installed his son. Jesus is Lord of all. He knows that those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Just like he did to Nebuchadnezzar in mercy. And just like he did to Belshazzar in judgment. And that truth is meant to comfort us as God's people. When we're meant, tempted to despair at the world, uh, and it gives us confidence when there are those seeds in our heart, those dark thoughts in our minds of being tempted to give up on God. It gives us courage to keep going in faith with our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's what we'll be doing as we'll be taking the Lord's Supper. We'll be asking God to feed us for the life of faith. He is the Lord of all. He is the Savior of all who believe. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So we live for him and we love him. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we do want to thank and praise you for your word. We want to thank you that um, it speaks with such clarity and it shines such a, a bright light into our world, into our hearts, and reveals truth and reality to us. Thank you for this portrait of Belshazzar, almost a caricature of God defiance that highlights the issues that are sometimes in our own hearts and in our world so clearly. Thank you for this display of your power. And thank you too for the reminder of your mercy in the Lord Jesus. That even though we have not honored you as God, though we knew this, still in your mercy, if and as we turn back to you, you promise to welcome us with open arms and to exalt us with Christ forevermore. We want to praise you and ask you to give us the courage to choose Christ. Some maybe for the very first time, and for many, again and again, day by day, moment by moment, to choose Christ and to live for him. And we pray it for his name's sake. Amen.